I look around at like the different stuff and I, I just feel like, wait, are you going to pull it from Sirianni this quickly? But I have to defer to the people that are around it every single day. I'm like, no, without Steichen, Jalen Hurts is not the same guy. And this is the problem. I still think Hurts is hurt with that offensive line. You know, now with Kelsey retiring, you're like, man, the window of having the best guy at center in the league. And now he's moving on from it all. But I just, I resist the impatience. I resist the idea that someone needs to be punished when the fan base is disappointed. But that's the corporate world and it leaks its way into football all the time, both in college and pro. I also have said this. I don't think Jalen's the problem. I think the scheme's the problem. Uncle Rye, how we doing? Good, Chris. How are you? I'm well. Just got out of my SUV on my weekly ride home to Virginia from sunny Philadelphia. As you know, it's always sunny there, uh, except for today, where there were three inches of snow on the ground, and it took me like six hours to get home. Ah, ouch. What are you driving right now? What are you pushing? What kind of whip? Well, I wasn't pushing the whip, Ryan. You know, I, I, I get an SUV, I sit in the back, and I get some work done. You know, listen to some audio books, oh. things like that. You wouldn't know about audio books because you like the real thing. Yeah, I like the hand. I like the hand wrapped around the, the spine of a good 700, 800 pager. You know, it makes me feel alive. And it's a good way to just kind of burn out that left arm, you know, because it's just holding it up the whole time. Um, although when you fall asleep on a plane with 700, 800 pages in your hand and it drops like people... They send security over. They're like, what the fuck? They're like, no, no, he's super into history. Don't worry about it. <laughs> so you just, it's just a thud? Yeah. How about it's the car a, service? It's a it's, he's reading Grant. Yeah. Which, by Don't the way, worry. I'm, I'm looking at your book right now. I got a nice bookshelf to put all the books that I haven't read yet. Uh, and, and Grant is just taking up some real estate. It's like the, the oldest, biggest lot in a crowded city. The old man just staring back at you. He is staring at me. All right, so you brought something up. You said plane rides, and it reminded me we haven't even talked about your trip. No, we haven't talked New Zealand. We can do it all, man. Can we I talk got, New Zealand real time. quick before we get in the NFL? That's more important. I'd love to. Yeah, we taped the travel pod. It's six parts. It'll come out All Star Weekend in February, so I'm excited about it. I don't want to step on that, but uh, no, it's all right. How We're about good. a new? Like eight out of ten trip, nine out of ten trip. I mean, you've traveled a lot of places alone. What's the loneliest you've ever felt on the road? Uh, <laughs> that's a good one, man. That's a really good question. I never felt alone in New Zealand ever. Uh, it was great. I would say it's nine out of ten. You know, I think ten out of ten is reserved for like. Remember that girl from that show like three years ago on HBO? Like, yeah, kind of kind of hung out with her in Queenstown, like just totally hit it off. You know, that's yeah. a 10 out of 10, yeah. likely not obtainable. Um, I would say, I, the, you know, look, a lot of time, you, you, as the audience knows, like you and I become really close. You know, we're almost like daily check-in guys now on a few years, which is which is pretty remarkable because I was, I was playing golf uh, with some guys and one of them was Joe Staley, uh, the left tackle for the, for the Niners. And he, he was like, man, he's like, your buddy's Chris, right? And I was like, yeah, I, I am. And I was just kind of laughing. I was like, north of 40 to become that close with just another buddy is pretty rare. So anyway, as I add that to it, little Joe Steely name drop in there, I... How's his golf game? Dude, he hit a six iron, I think 260 yards into a hill. So it, there was no run on it. It wasn't, it landed at 210 and he got this incredible roll. Like he's right off of the right off of the swing, we were like, "Oh my god, he's sailing this green!" And then I was like, "What did you hit?" It's <laughs> like a six iron. And then he had another drive where it was it was three forty seven, I think, with zero, like it's stuck. Oh damn! Like, so he can really hit him. Yeah, just yeah. not straight is what I'm gathering. Um, look, I was so bad. It's the worst round I've played all year. So I don't have shit to say about anybody. I mean, it was, it's a, a guy, Chad Smith, who's a big, big time trainer guy. I think he just decided to be a professional badass because he's been Chad really nice Smith to is. me. Yeah. So he reached out to me years ago. And of course, like back to the new friend thing, I'm like, what does this guy want to be like buddies or something like new friends? And then you start looking at him and he trains all these NFL guys. 
And then I saw a video of him doing jujitsu where he picks this guy up and puts him like into the earth. And I asked him, I was like, what the fuck was that video? He's like, I think that guy quit jujitsu after that meet. And he just couldn't be nicer. So he invites me down to golf and he's like, are you any good? And I go, I'm not, but I've been playing and it's, it's gotten progressively better. Like I expect to be good at some point here. Like I feel like I'm putting some things together and I just, there was nothing that worked. Everything was a mess. And then of course the other guy that we played with um, has the course record or did at some point. And his brother, uh, his younger brother, Nap, just got his tour card. So it was it was a tough group to play with uh, when you sucked. I, and I sucked. Like, of course, everybody wanted to bet. I was like, no problem. I want in on the bets. So like, what's your handicap? I'm like, put me down for like a 22. And then everybody thinks you're sandbagging him. And then by like the third hole, they're like, oh, this guy's not lying. Like, well, actually, he was lying the other way. So compare your game to an NFL quarterback real quick before we get into New Zealand. Um, Peterman? No, no, no. It would have to be... It was so bad for this round that these guys will push back on it, but there's just moments. I'd say Anthony Richardson. I'd be like, there's moments where you're like, whoa, what the fuck is that? So you play golf for three regular season games. <laughs> yeah, there's like three holes <laughs> where you go, okay. Every there time might be you something. go golfing... You get too physical and you have to leave the round. <laughs> no, I'm saying sure though, the, the future there'll, holds. There'll be a moment where the rest of the will be like, where, what, how, what, what club did you just use there? And yeah, I'll be like, oh, that was an eight iron. And like, for like you just hit it 180, and I'll go, yeah, well, you know, if I'm hitting it right, that's what I expect to do. Or like, where are you aiming? And I'm like, I'm aiming over here. I'm like, oh, and then out of nowhere like i'll save a par with an insane so there's just always a, a couple moments yeah. where it's, they're like what yeah they're like well how come you suck because there's things that you're doing that show you shouldn't suck anthony richardson hasn't been around long enough um maybe <laughs> kyle bowler <laughs> i've played with kyle bowler i've played with about 30 quarterbacks that'd be a fun exercise okay rye all tell right. me. Oh, so New Zealand. New Zealand, real quick. Yeah, tell me about the New reason. Zealand. The reason we went on that tangent is I had a lot of moments where I'm like, you know who would love this? Chris would love this. Chris would love this. You know, get to Auckland, uh, went to a basketball game, Breakers Bowl, little New Zealand Breakers action, uh, made it over to Wahiki, this incredible island 40 minutes north on a ferry where at one point you think you're in. A, a sort of a slower part of Maui. And then all of a sudden you think you're in the French countryside at all these wineries. And then I made it down to Queenstown, which is like a skiing village in Colorado. Also like Switzerland, sort of like Lucerne, but not as big where it's this incredible lake where the lake is at 1200 feet above sea level, but at its lowest point, And I know you love this kind of stuff. When we're talking sea level. Don't Chris, tell me it's below sea level. The, its depth is 1300 oh stop feet. it rye right so you're think about it you're in the town 1200 above sea level hey the deepest part of this lake every single guy like hey you know this like hey this is great so you actually negative 100 <laughs> and i was like what you know man there was a ton of times like i sat next to a guy i was on a 10 seat plane and he was like you're shotgun or and I was like, what? And he's like, well, you weigh the most. You weigh the most. I say, yeah, yeah, you weigh the most me, stones, mate. Yeah. yeah, he's like, don't touch the yoke, okay, mate. And I was like, what? <laughs> and so I was like, all right, no problem. And then he had a headset on, and I didn't have a fucking headset on. He's like, right, that, that, great, like, right, that, 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 that. And I'm like, I, I looked at this guy at the end, and then he took like a big turn. He looked at me. It was like, so I was like, he's got a caravan, you know? And I'm, I'm okay. like, and, and, right. And I'm just looking at him going, yeah. And I'm doing fake laughs. I was just like, oh my God. Yeah. Great point. Oh yeah. No, right. Yeah, totally. I get it. Because when the guys get rolling, even though I was so excited to get that lake fact in there for you, there was a lot of stuff. There's a lot of stuff that's, I don't know that was said to me. When I watch British indie films, I watch them with the subtitles on. Same I don't with, blame especially you. the Irish ones about like, you know, the whole IRA thing. And uh, hey, there's some American movies now that are getting subtitles from this guy. Cause I'll be like, what, what was that? Bro? That's just called getting old. Honestly. Or, I or started, really, or caring about every word of dialogue. I care about every word too. I'm always like, what the fuck did, what did he say? I lose the plot. So New Zealand would, would recommend any downsides to New Zealand. You know, people are like, so there was the whole story about Bill Gates. He's building a bunker. 
in Hawaii, right? Did you see that whole? I thought fucking... that was Zuck. No, it was Zuck. Sorry, Gates. Here's the difference between Gates. What and What do you know? Here's the difference between Gates and Zuck. Gates isn't going to tell you where he's building his fucking bunker. Yeah, big. Why time. is Zuck telling you where his bunker is? But evidently, I digress. That uh, you know, like they're they're the real hideout for the billionaires at the end at the end of the line here for humanity is New Zealand. So, is there any downside to New Zealand if you're looking to relocate? I'd imagine, you know, getting your, your stuff delivered there is probably a little more challenging. Amazon, you know, you know thirteen hour flight from L.A., twelve hour flight. Uh, it, I didn't really look, you're not looking forward to it, but then when you're doing it, you're just doing it and it's kind of over and I've gotten better at the flight stuff. Usually North of five hours. I was like freaking out being like, do I have enough activities the whole time? Um, you know, I just don't, I, there really wasn't that much downside at all. It was 21 hours ahead. By the way, do you know there are 38 time zones in the world? That doesn't make a ton of sense, but it's true. Cause I started researching time zones a bit. Okay. Um, yeah. So, cause <laughs> don't, I was like, wait, don't, don't tell Dr. Fax this. He walked around for three days after New Year's telling the story about two twins that were born in different years. One was well, born at 11.59. Yeah. One was born at 12.03 a.m. How is that possible, guys? Two twins, same family, different years. Don't tell him about the time zones, dude. Usually twins are the same family. Yeah, I know. He was... He, he, he was making sure I understood what was so remarkable about this fact. <laughs> like, yeah, what the fuck is he talking about? Yeah, it was right? one at a time. It was the it was it was it was one out of the birth canal, then Carson Daly, and then one more out of the birth canal. But explain the time zone thing. It's twenty one hours ahead. So when I left L.A. on a Wednesday night, red eye, which is even funnier, um, it's pretty classic me. You have to fill out some government approval thing. It's basically a $50 shakedown from New Zealand, but it wasn't letting me check in on my phone. I was like, whatever, I'll get to the airport. I don't live that far away. It took an hour. It was LAX. You never know. Sometimes it's awful. I was like, man, the international flight, I'm cutting this a little close. Get to Delta. They're like, you can't check in. I'm like, what is going on? And they're like, go to the kiosk, go to the front desk. Both people are like, we don't know what's going on. You can't get in. And then you start thinking like, Hey, I kind of scheduled this around where I've got some free time. So maybe I'll just go to Colorado or maybe I'll go to Montecito. Maybe I'll go to Carmel. Maybe I'll just keep driving north because if I don't jump on a 12 hour flight right now, I guess I'll be fine or whatever. And they're like, you need to fill out this form and it could take three days to get approved. I was like, so I might not be going to New Zealand as I'm sitting there with my bag in my hand. And then you start going like, man, I'd be on the couch in 15 minutes from this house. That's the you biggest know. impediment for me yeah. when it comes to traveling. You said, you know, Chris, you'd love New Zealand. And uh, it doesn't sound like a place inside my house. So um, <laughs> as I get older, I'm more content staying home. Uh, I know we're going to talk about a lot today, Rye. Um, the NFL, obviously wild card weekend, but we got a little sh short mailbag at the end of this thing. Yeah, I love um, the mailbag. A little short mailbag. Hey, by the way, last question about New Zealand. Did you, uh, did you, wear, your, um, did you wear your togs? What did your togs look like? My togs? Mm -hmm. Yeah, mate. I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> That's slang, bro. You fucking noob. It's slang for wow. any swimming costume, bikini, or one piece, or trunks. And I was wondering what your togs look like. What are you going with these days? Uh, three quarter thigh, mid thigh. What are you doing? Because last time we were together, um, my son made fun of you for your shorts. Yeah, um, that's totally fine. I, uh, I'll tell you right now, I grabbed a Ron Dorf swimming trunk deal. You can check it out. Okay, the look. designer's Ron Dorf. And it was, a, it was a turquoise number. I went with the trunks. I did not go with the briefs. We're not there yet. God damn, uh, when I Google Ron Dorf, it's, it's a bunch of banana hammocks, son. Yeah. I got to be honest with you. I started, once I, once I was in the Ron Dorf shop, I did look around a bit. And was like, what's going on in here? <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, okay. From Ron so Dorf. I'm not sure. I just, I just like the way they look. <laughs> Ron Dorf to Wild, Wild Card Weekend. Right. What was your biggest uh, takeaway this weekend? I mean, is Super Wild Card Weekend getting it done for you? It's been a couple of years of this. It's a lot of football. The weather, the games. What, what, what struck you? Look, there, there's plenty of stuff. You wish the games were closer and all that kind of stuff. But I think in a 
in a funny way, like we had a lot of primetime games that I thought were terrible and then they were close. So then at the end of the close primetime game that sucked for two hours and 45 minutes, everybody's like, man, this game was still so much fun. And, uh, you know, I'd, I'd rather just see great games. And um, we didn't see that this weekend. I think the biggest thing was kind of like comparing Dallas's downfall at home against Philadelphia and what we saw last night from them on the road in Tampa. We knew that Dallas was two different teams, but they were a great team at home. This is the number one scoring offense. This yeah. group has been scoring a ton of points now uh, under McCarthy for a while. And next thing you know, they're down 27 nothing. I think it speaks to who Jordan Love has been in the second half, the receiving group, or it could be like one of any three guys that gets you. And then Aaron Jones has been like completely different for, for uh, four straight weeks. Yeah. You throw in the early pick, you throw in the pick six, and like it's just completely gotten away from you. And I'm laughing about how, like, Dak, a year from now going into the playoffs, if they're in the playoffs again, people are like, you know, he still had 400 yards in that game against the Packers. You're like, all right, cool, awesome. So that was, you know, a Cowboys embarrassing loss brings the nation together in a way that I don't know any other pro sports team being embarrassed can bring the nation together, especially now post-Belichick and Brady with New England, because I just yeah. don't, you know, it's it's there's not a comp to Dallas. So as we had that in our back pocket, I personally felt like Philadelphia's effort, the tackling, the adjustments, um, it's an offensive line that's incredible, but Tampa just blitzed the shit out of them the whole time, and there never was anything different from it. You get the hurt safety, you've got... Which um, which on that safety they're just they've been heating them up heating them up and then they bring four, right right so still like hurts you know going through what he went through last year you're like man an older court and I know he's not older but he's had all this stuff and the tackling alone if you just did a rip up if you had to sit there and watch film if there was like week seventeen coming up and you were on that defense. I mean, I would just be like, stop the projector. I don't want to watch this anymore. So I, and look, I just think Love in Green Bay is a far more formidable offense than Baker in Tampa, who scored nine points against Carolina to close out the regular season. So I felt like the Philadelphia part of it was actually more alarming. Like it was so bad, I might not pick Philadelphia in week one of next year. Right. That, that taste is not going to leave your mouth. I mean, it's, it's bad, especially. What did you think? Is that crazy? Because I think most people still think the Dallas thing because they're at home and it was 27 nothing. where Philadelphia is still technically, what, it's 16-9 into the third quarter. And you're like, what are you talking about? So I just felt like watching Philadelphia and all these different facets of the game, I'm like, uh, what is up with these guys? Like, what happened to that guy? What happened to that group? I, I think what's funny about it is the defense, I completely understand. I'm not shocked by it. You know, it's this. We've been pin, on this. We you know the line at this for ahead. a while, right? Like you yeah. know, it's the backers. It's neglecting that part of the roster. It's having injuries in that part of the roster. It's having injuries on the back end, and that group already. I think that when you have a veteran laden group in general, um, you have to be careful in figuring out where with players it's the end of the line. Um, and I've heard, I think, Howie say this. Uh, in the past, maybe as it applied to me, when at the end of my career, we were talking about, you know, how long I'm going to stick around and that sort of thing, or what my role might be in that sort of thing. Um, it was actually Schwartz, I think. Schwartz was like, I like to get a year ahead on players. You know, you try to pinpoint when the guy's going to drop off in productivity. And I think there were a couple key players in the back end that either lost a step or were being used out of position. I think you know, Bradbury fell off a little bit. And I'm not saying that in a disrespectful way. It happens to all of us. But he certainly isn't a man corner. And, you know, that's part of the reason he ended up in, in Philly. And, you know, I'm watching snaps like last night where Mike Evans is beating him to the pylon on a uh, – surprise, surprise – on a on on the first of two touchdowns, essentially, that they gave up in one drive. You know, it's like Mike drops the ball at the pylon – very next play two plays later it's an explosive for a touchdown and so part of it is personnel and part of it is scheme but I don't think they had a chance uh from the beginning and I don't think any of us realized it until the onion kept getting peeled back man the two coordinators that you have to replace that's such a rare thing so I, I would put it this way I give you an example like Bradbury I give you an example like Slay getting hurt but Slay not being the same guy give you an example like the linebackers and the front was really, really good last year. But the group got a little bit older. 
and the coverage got worse. And so the fractions of time don't really work in that situation. And, you know, if you, if you look at the offense, I'm a little bit more confounded because it's so clearly the scheme. It's so clearly the scheme, right? I mean, it's the same guys. We came into that game last night and we were like, if they don't fucking run the ball, they should all be fired, right? That's what kind of the sentiment was in the city. And I know that it's not that simple. But they have not been able to establish that part of the offense all year long. At, not all year long, but as the year has worn on. And the strength of your team is that offensive front. And so, you know, the, the passing game stuff is bad. That first third down, there's no hots. They're blitzing you the whole night. You have no answers for it. There's people in the wrong place. There's people in the same place. It's scheme and it's personnel on defense. And I think it was a lot of scheme offensively. I don't understand not adjusting to the pressure from Tampa. You know, there's some numbers that I saw this morning that I shared on my podcast. You had 10 unblocked rushers uh, on 10 snaps, which is a season high for any team to have 10 guys run free and get pressure. Um, there was 13 dropbacks where Hertz had less than two and a half seconds, which ties a career high for him. And I've always felt like, again, in my limited understanding of design and play calling and then the adjustments, but you'd want a team to just blitz you, blitz you incessantly if you'd like your guy behind center. Like, I've just seen it with the better quarterbacks. It's like, wait, you think you're going to, like, you may, you may trick them every now and then. You may show it and then drop out of it. You may do something else. And I know, like, there's guys like Spagnuolo that you just know on the big third and seven, like, it's coming. Yes. Uh, although I do think he dropped out in, like, a super predictable pressure situation against Miami because everybody talks about it all the time. Well, I mean, look but what this, Todd did on the safety. You know, it's the same Right, thing. exactly. It's, exactly. It's, I'm going to give you a fuckload of this. You're going to be scrambling to adjust. Even though I can't, I can't understand why they had to adjust. I mean, like you should come into the game knowing they blitzed you out the ass the first time. The second time they did the same thing. And the most astounding thing, Rod, was they didn't load the box last night. It was just run pressures and and being behind the sticks and being afraid of it. But go ahead. Yeah, that's what I I don't understand because you could see really quickly when a couple runs weren't really working for them. They went, I think, 17 to 18 plays were dropbacks. And it was in the second, and it was like, all right, they've already kind of abandoned this whole thing. And, you know, I always joke about if I were an athletic director in college, I might be the best guy to ever work for because I just completely resist the idea that, all right, we have expectations. We did not meet those expectations. I think our coach is good. Everybody kind of agrees that our coach is good. So just because everybody's mad because things were bad this year doesn't mean I have to do something about it. And college football has just gotten to a point where it's like if your third season, you haven't done anything, and that third season's a bad season. It's like, we just have to fire you. And it's just like, what, wait, what? I mean, there's guys – Harbaugh is one of my favorite examples. Like, they're in the mix. They're in the mix. They have a couple disappointing seasons. They have the terrible COVID season. And people are saying, like, he shouldn't be the head coach. You're like, well, wait. If everybody with Michigan is happy with him, they actually think he's a pretty good coach. His track record tells us he's an incredible coach. Like, why do you need to fire him and start the whole cycle all over again? So when I see the Mike McCarthy stuff where – you know, they 12 wins, three straight years, the offensive numbers, the defensive numbers there with Dan Quinn. See that Sirianni, despite the opening presser, it became this awesome story of like this guy's just himself. Different guys that I had talked to would be like, man, you would love to play for somebody like Sirianni. Like this guy's incredible. And yeah, they're probably the most disappointing team, especially when you factor in they were 10 and 1 at some point, even though the 10 and 1 felt a little fluky if you were watching them every single week. And then it completely falls apart and you lose to a team that the only reason they're even in the playoffs with that record is because the rest of the division was terrible. Tampa's probably seven wins at best in some other division. And you're still going to lose. Like, I thought they could get this one and then I didn't want to pick them after it because yeah. of everything we'd seen. This is the part of the business where I get the guys are getting paid more and all these different things. But if ownership in the front office still – they must have liked Sirianni enough and felt like they were rewarded for believing in him, I don't know why he's supposed to be fired as bad, as embarrassing as Monday night was. I will say this. All right, put into context Sirianni's couple years here. By the way, I'm holding this in smooth. Very underrated flavor. As smooth you doesn't know, get any credit. Yeah. And it really is just bad branding. Um because gray and red don't go together. That doesn't look delicious, but really it is. Um, when it comes to Nick Sirianni, I think, I think in the decision that 
maybe they're not even considering anything. You know, like a lot of it is like we publicly speculate things automatically sure. because of the climate and because there's nine head coaching openings. Like I said this about Vrabel when Vrabel got fired. If Vrabel was coaching in 1993, he'd coach for 20 years. Things have changed. You know, it's just. But they're stupid. I mean, look, if Vrabel, uh, it's Vrabel not, wanted to it stay. Right. It doesn't make Vrabel it right. Vrabel wanted to stay. So you want to tell me the last couple of years have been disappointing? Sure, fine. When they were the one seed, that's the worst one seed, I think, in 20 years when I've gone back and he looked at some of the data. He fucked himself right? by being the one seed. He, 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 set, he set himself up for a standard that was going to be hard to meet with that group. And, and, right. and, and how many times do we have to see this movie? Okay? The head coach got you to the one seed. You lose to the Bengals 19-13, who, oh, by the way, were the people representing the AFC in the Super Bowl, and they got a quarterback who's about three times as good as the quarterback as you had. And the quarterback you had is the reason you lose that game. And I'm not, I got nothing against Ryan Tannehill. I've given him his flowers this year because I think he's a fucking tough guy, a good, a good, solid pro quarterback who had a good run there and deserves a lot of credit. But – are you shocked? And then from there, it's the A.J. Brown trade. It's him and the GM and probably some, hey, you, you know, you got to do it this way. And he's like, fuck you, fuck you, I'm, you know, I'm out. Um, and I, I think if he coached in the 90s with his track record, you're two years removed from this really great run, and I think he hides the floor of the organization really well, I think he'd still have a job. Also, the, the game's changed, right? So people are not going to be – we talk about defensive head coaches. There's a question I was going to ask you, and I want to get to Nick in a second. But defensive head coaches, how many do you think uh, they're going to be at any given time in five years? I, I, feel like I, do. We're, I feel like we're in a weird spot, dude. I really do. I'm not saying they're going to uh, go away. They're dinosaurs, but they're like, you know – Look, man, I, I think this stuff is real cyclical. Like, we're in a down cycle now from scoring. We were at, like, 24, almost 25 points per game four years ago, and there's been a steady decline. We're about a field goal off per team now. Teams are averaging about 21 points, so it sounds like the defense is caught up to some of this. We or the, or the quarterbacks are hurt. Yeah, there's – there's well, yeah, but I did that number two. It was, like, how many different starting quarterbacks do you have over the course of the last 20 seasons – ran the numbers on that. I thought we were way ahead of it this season, and it's kind of in line with a bunch of other seasons. Now, you could say that because this is its own topic, which I've talked about in the past, where you know, you're know you a third or fourth rounder, you don't get any reps, you never really get any games in, and then you just get cut without ever proving anything because the guy in front of you is good, and you get cut and replaced with like the next fourth rounder. So you're never ever developing any of these guys. Exactly. So, you could argue the defenses were better, not because more quarterbacks played, because that number holds up over. I was shocked when I went back and looked at all the numbers, a bit of recency bias. I was like, man, look at the lineup today. Like, who are these guys? Like, man, this is getting really, really bad. Oh, wait, we're kind of in line with how many different players have started the position over the, each individual year. You could argue that this year we had a lot of guys with no experience starting in some of these games, where maybe historically the old, the old. <laughs> KG, the KG, yeah. you know, yeah. I'm trying to think of the right guy. Like the, there weren't Chris a lot Chandler. of Brian Hoyers. Matter of fact, you know, maybe, just, maybe happy trails to Brian Hoyer. He's like 39 years old, man. He'll be a coach. It's yeah, easy. there's just not very much experience because you're always thinking like, what if we actually kind of hit on one of these younger dudes and then we have them in practice and we don't love the starter? Like maybe that's the way it works. So you end up giving these jobs to guys that have never really even played it. So look, I've gotten on a tangent there. No, I but, would argue, no, real quick though, on the defensive thing, I don't think it's gone, but I also wouldn't blame any owner for wanting to do it because of all the McVeigh tree and Shanahan tree jokes. A lot of that shit's worked, man. LaFleur's worked. McDaniel with two right. has worked. Zach Taylor with Burrow has worked. So people were mad about these guys kind of cutting the line and getting these opportunities. There's more success than there is failure. Kevin O'Connell, terrific play caller, head coach, one of my favorites. Um, I think D'Amico Ryans did a great job this year, and he's the easy retort to why would you hire a defensive head coach. Um, not taking anything away from him, I think he also is a special quarterback. So I think, you know, if you're a defensive head coach in today's day and age, you better make sure you got a really good GM. I think when you look around the league, and this is where I'm going to get to Sirianni, most head coaches are offensive play callers. But not, you know, like I did a breakdown here of how many defensive-minded head coaches there are. 
And, you know, there's a couple guys here. I mean, like if you, if you name them all, uh, there's a couple former players, which I think differentiate you a little bit as a leader, like Antonio Pierce, if he keeps that job, Mike Vrabel, you know, he'll get another job. Uh, Todd Bowles. I don't know if you count it. He's an, he's a former player that matters. I also think this is a special circumstance where, Hey, if Tom Brady doesn't show up in Tampa Bay, is Todd Bowles somehow still the coach of the Tampa Bay Buccaneers? I don't think so. I think that ship sails a long time ago if Tom doesn't pick Tampa. So in most, in most scenarios, and ironically, you got three defensive head coaches in the playoffs right now because McDermott, as bad as people want to talk about him, he's got Josh Allen. That kind of helps. But most of these coaches are either looking for jobs or or might be looking for jobs soon. And there's a couple that you're like, yeah, we'll see. Eberflus, uh, you know, Gannon just got a job. But Sala hasn't been great. Tomlin just walked out of the press conference. We've been talking about firing him for two months. Bill Belichick, the GOAT, got fired. Or, or parted ways with RKK, Dennis Allen. Here's the thing that's interesting about Dennis Allen. I think for some of these coaches, this might creep into the, the, the calculus. So say you're um, the Benson family down there. I think that's who owns the team. You got a great GM and Mickey Loomis. You got Dennis Allen, who is a good defensive coach, but the offense is underperformed. So you throw Carmichael under the bus. You're still stuck with Derek Carr or Carolina as an example. If your setup isn't ideal, maybe you punt a year. Like New Orleans, you say, hey, do I really want to be the 10th vacancy and you know join a pool of nine other competing teams for talent at the head coach position? And why would a good head coach pick this situation? So I think sometimes, uh, as a sidebar, a Dennis Allen not getting fired, it looks curious, but maybe they're saying, we'll wait a year. You know what I mean? Um, we'll try to find a coordinator and in a year we'll figure it out. But most of the guys on this list, man, Ron Rivera, probably not going to get a job again. I'm not saying they're going extinct, but the calculus you have to make, if you just look at the numbers, it's offensive play caller. And it's not just offensive mind who doesn't call plays. And I think when you look at Sirianni in the column for don't keep him, and I want to make this clear, I haven't come to a conclusion on this. The season just ended. I kind of want to hear what they want to do. Um, but Sirianni doesn't call plays anymore. How many, when you see play calling as an offensive head coach, when you give that up, that is a terminal illness, Ryan. What's the life expectancy on guys that have given up play calling duties in the NFL historically? This guy, it's pie in the sky where we are for Nick. It's been two years. He gave up play calling duties the first year. So you're telling me, and I think what adds insult to injury is for the, for the Eagles, they had Steichen in the building, you know, and that guy's terrific. I think the jury's still out on Nick. I like him. I think he, he did something incredible, got the team to the Super Bowl, but these were his hires. These were his coordinator hires. And so how many coaches can I remember seating play calling duty, hitting on a coordinator, the coordinator leaving, there's a regression uh, with the second guy, and then you get another opportunity to either pick them or stand by while Howie and Jeffrey pick them. I think it's a really unique situation. And how many offensive head coaches don't call plays right now, Ry? So it's a Most really... of them don't. No, no, that's not true. What, offensive play calling from a head coach? Stefanski... Shanahan, McDaniel, Shanahan. Peterson. It's more, it's more than you think. Peterson just seeded it down in Jacksonville, but there's also been guys who will give it up and then take it back. Like right. I guess I'm look. I'm looking at the number of 32. I'm not doing a high like a side thing. I'd still think it would be less than 16. It might be, but there were 11 defensive or special teams head coaches to start the year. So then, if you take the you know the subcategory of offensive head coaches, right. okay. which is what Sirianni fixed. Fits that's 19 or so, and I would say the vast majority are calling plays. You know, there are guys who are, and as I would put it, like kind of special motivators, they have differentiating factors, like a Dan Campbell. I don't think a lot of people stop to consider that he is an offensive coach that you know, not just played in the league, but he was he, he was a coach on a high level staff. You know, he learned a lot from Peyton, and he's got that it factor as a motivator. Most guys either have to be geniuses that call the plays and run the show because number one, you don't want to lose your coordinator. 
you know, if you're a defensive head coach, I think that's the biggest thing that concerns me about Bobby Slowick leaving. I think CJ's special, and he might be recession proof, but we saw it with Josh and Dable. We saw it with Steichen and Jalen Hurts. Like, it is, it, it's a worry for me if you're hiring a defensive head coach. You just have to be careful. I imagine, though, that any owner that's either about to draft a young quarterback or is looking at a guy being like, can we, can we unlock him, looks at McDaniel and Tua. Like, McDaniel should be the highest paid coach in the NFL. He should be up because, there. Because Tua, you know, you were on this early. And you're like, man, the numbers are good, but there just seems to be something. And, you know, I don't have the all 22 and all that stuff, but I always would look for, like, look at the delivery of the football on the first read versus anything that now off a of schedule a little bit. And what they did with him and turning him into somebody who's like, what's his next contract going to be like as opposed to what his next team is, you're going, if you're an NFL ownership and your son's reporting to you after he's fucked around in his 20s, <laughs> now he wants the team. Yeah. You know, like you're sitting there with your inner circle as an owner of one of these teams. You're like, is McDaniel the only guy that can do it? Yeah. Like that can't be the answer. There has to be another guy out there. Or does McDaniel have the perfect disposition, the unbelievable ability to both X and O a guy up beyond what you think his ceiling is and then also make that person feel so good about him and it makes me think that mcdaniel could just retire and do his own kind of bar rescue but with quarterbacks you know he shows up to carson <laughs> wentz feel good. right right like carson's sitting there with his rams gear on and yeah they're off to the side and mcdaniel goes you were let go and Foles had won a super bowl when you got hurt and maybe yeah. gonna win the mvp like you know after taffer's mad at the entire staff and he shuts it down on a just a a tough open, like minute 38 of bar rescue is where he sits with Wentz and gets Wentz to cry. He's just motherfucking Brian Johnson in the corner. And then he goes to Jalen. And honestly, I think Wentz did, he looked pretty good against San Francisco. And, and he came up in conversation the other day because we were talking about this very thing. I think that not, if you want to know, like, and people think I'm vindictive on this thing, but every time I bring up the Miami situation, it's a new conversation with the quarterback. So let me weigh in on this. Compare the list of teams that would be willing to trade for Tua to the list of quarterbacks that might make you better than you are now. Which right. list is longer? Yeah, yeah, the second by one. a factor of four, by a factor of five. I don't know if you can do the 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 because I really mean you're that. not saying Wentz. Are you saying Wentz would be better than Tua in Miami? Yeah, somebody said that, not me. Who said? I it? promise you, I didn't say it. Somebody, Wait, somebody. Somebody, somebody that matters. That. Somebody close to me said. Somebody who knows ball said that, and I was like, "Waylon, it's not my dad, it's not my son, it's nobody in my biological family." But the point I'm making is, when you look at a situation like that, and you look at countless other situations, league, the, the 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 coordinator matters. And for Nick, I do see that magnetism. I've been around him. I like the guy, dude. He got them to the Super Bowl. And the anti part of it is this. I don't think they want to be one of the first teams to ever fire a guy a year removed from a Super Bowl. I don't think Jeffrey Lurie wants to look like David Tepper. I don't think Howie Roseman wants to be, you know, one of a few teams that ever fired a guy after a playoff loss. You know, like, uh, it just doesn't happen much. And I also think there's some credence to, hey, when in doubt, in a year with nine vacancies – Maybe we just get back and get to the front of the line the next year if this doesn't work out. And another thing is this. I think they're in a unique situation because of the decision they have to make. Because, again, how many teams have ever given a guy a second chance after he seated the play caller twice, right? The life expectancy is not long. He's already in overtime. But um, the other problem is this. The other problem is for Philly – and I mentioned this earlier, they had Steichen in the building. How many teams can look around right now and say, the, the guy? And I'm not saying Nick can't be a great coach. He coached them the Super Bowl. Shane hadn't done that yet. But as a play caller, going the way of the NFL right now, you had that guy in the building, and he's no longer with you, and he led Gardner Minshew to the playoffs. You know what I mean? Um, damn near. It was a playoff game. It felt like a playoff game. It, it felt like one because it yeah, felt like right. one because it's not like the NBA where you guys have to manufacture playing games and shit. We have like a play in month, but I think that's rare. 
How many teams, like honestly, if you look at Herbert since Steichen, a lot of people would argue he hasn't progressed, you know? So I, that's a special dude. And there's two franchises who are like, man, he was in the fucking building. And I can't remember the last time that happened. If you look around the league, that doesn't happen a lot. Kyle Shanahan leaving Atlanta is probably the last situation like that. Maybe that a year later, you know, Atlanta goes on one more playoff run and then they fire Dan the year after that. And I bet you Shanahan would still be the coach if it was a succession thing. So it is Jerry Krause week. I call back to that situation where he's like, nah, Phil's the guy. You know, that had to, that took big balls, right? Coaches don't do that a lot, but sometimes you got the right guy in the building, draw the straightest line to your success as a team in today's NFL, which is you need play callers that are head coaches. I'm not saying Nick can't be one of those rare guys in a couple of years, but you are taking a risk. Yeah, and look, they moved off Peterson, you know, and the guy won a Super Bowl. So what did he get? He got a nine and seven, a nine and seven, a four eleven season. I mean, even that felt like it was a little quick. So uh Lurie's not the I most always patient. defer yeah, Lurie's not the What's most that? patient. He's not he's not impatient. He's not Tepper, but he's not Rooney. That reminds me though when the two thousand one Red Sox had Jimmy Williams and just it run its course, but Joe Kerrigan was there and everybody called him like this incredible pitching coach, but they didn't like to make pitching coaches managers because basically position players don't respect pitchers. And they gave it to him. They're like, Hey, we're gonna lose this guy. This guy's the fucking back yeah. slider whisperer um he was fired he got an extension and the new ownership came in and they fired it doesn't him. work as well in baseball you yeah, was just we, making me think of the steichen thing because you're like well what are you supposed to do you're just supposed to fire sirian like wouldn't that team will never do that be like, you know hey, we kind of like our head coach you know you know <laughs> you know what i'm yeah, saying i know exactly i know exactly what you're saying i mean it's every time the commander's coaching tree graphic shows up and then every single washington fans like this sucks it's like well, what were you going to do you you would have been you would have been chill with McVay getting the job at 26. Right, exactly, dude. <laughs> you yeah. know, like, give me I'm a not break. Saying, hey, listen, I just want a disclaimer for anybody listening. I don't like firing coaches in the cities that I played, period, on a podcast. And I'd like to hear what their plan is. It's just going to be tough to thread the needle. What they're basically going to try to do if they keep him is they're going to try to to win the 2025 head coaching cycle a year early. Do you know how hard that is to do? Because all the play callers – are getting head coaching jobs. So to me, you'd have to go get like a Frank Smith kind of guy. I got a funny one for you people in Philly. Didn't mean to you people, everybody in Philly. <laughs> but Chip You're Kelly, Chip Kelly. <laughs> Can you imagine Chip Kelly returns to the city of brotherly love and calls the plays for, uh, for Nick Sirianni. You let bygones be bygones. Maybe Cliff. I hear Cliff. It's reported that Cliff and Antonio Pierce would be a good marriage in Vegas. And I want it to happen, Ryan, because I want close-ups of that tired face living on the strip. If I were an owner, I would say, okay, what's my quarterback situation? It's like, we're not going to get a good one this year. We're going to be okay. Vrabel's the first call that I make. Yes. Right? I don't care about play calling. I don't care about offensive development. If you're telling me, like, hey, New Orleans is going to eat some of that Derek Carr money and this is the best that we can do uh, – you know, and I really wanted to see Vrabel with Will Levis because, you know, I'm not sure. I'm never sure about, like, any of these quarterbacks unless it's a guy who I'm completely writing off going, absolutely no chance. I've watched him too many Saturdays. Or the guy that I've watched on Saturdays in a Caleb Williams. Like, I'm going to be shocked if he doesn't make a real impact at this position for a long time in the league. But I – I look around at like the different stuff and I, I just feel like, wait, are you going to pull it from Sirianni this quickly? But I have to defer to the people that are around it every single day. And I'm like, no, without Steichen, Jalen Hurts is not the same guy. And this is the problem. I still think Hurts is hurt with that offensive line. You know, now with Kelsey retiring, you're like, man, the window of having the best guy at center in the league. And now he's moving on from it all. But I just, I resist the impatience. I resist the idea that someone needs to be punished when the fan base is disappointed. But that's, the corporate world and it leaks its way into football all the time, both in college and pro. Well, I will say this last thing. If they're keeping Sirianni, Hertz certainly didn't stick his neck out for him last night in the post game. He's hurt, he, man. He's got to be hurt. I, I, I think he's hurt. I also have said this. I don't think Jalen's the problem. I think the scheme's the problem. There are six guys in the NFL who to me right now are currently exempt from – 
you know, the issues that plague other people when context changes. You want to guess who those six quarterbacks are that no. I put in that elite category? Who the elite? Just just right now, the standard of elite in the yeah, NFL. Yeah, because I think what yeah, Cam Newton said. Cam Newton said something without. He said the right thing with the wrong terms, in my opinion. Because I don't like the. It's kind of reductive, the game manager thing, and it's like, it's like everybody's the same. There's there's a spectrum of game managers or whatever you want to call guys. Game changers, game managers, guys you can win with, guys you can win without. The the guys you can win with, it's a short list. Who do you think that list is? It's Mahomes. It's Burrow. It's Allen, it's Lamar, uh, it is Stroud already. Come on. All right, you've already Bro, got Stroud there? Have you, I mean, it's you ridiculous. watched Stroud a lot this year, right? Yeah, I, look, I can't knock a single thing, but I'm, you know, when I start talking about like top five stuff, like I have a rule with NBA players. You can be playing like a top five player, but for you to actually have one of those special robes, I got to see it for like two years. I you think know, the NBA go, is all right, different. You're... All right, that's fine. So you want to put Stroud as a top five difference maker. Top six. Top six. All right, so he's ahead of Herbert for you? Oh, yeah, right now? Yeah. Right now, yeah. Yeah, okay. okay. Right now, yeah. And I'm talking about right now because that's the thing we get caught right up here, in. Right here, right now? Is Gilgis Alexander a top five player? This year he might be. I don't know anything about the fucking NBA, but his name's been coming up a lot. An example of a guy who has a great year. You call him a top five guy that year, as long as, you know, in basketball. Is Jordan Love the sixth? Jordan Love, to me, is the guy that when we start next season, we're going to be filling airtime with, is Jordan Love elite? But he's right outside six. You are forgetting the guy who played as good as any fucking quarterback on the planet this weekend. Brock, oh, wait a minute. This weekend? Um, I already said Allen. I already he's said He's in your Mahomes. city, dude. What? Matthew Stafford, bro. I love Stafford. I just didn't think anybody at this stage of his career would have him as a top six guy. I look, you don't have Did to you, talk to me about Stafford. Yeah. I I was I went to that game. I'm like, who are you secret? Like, I didn't have a rooting interest. I'm like, but what are you kind of rooting for? And I was like, I'm kind of root for Detroit because of this whole thing and the Campbell and the city. And like, imagine telling a fan base being like, hey, you're gonna be bummed out for three straight decades. Are you interested? <laughs> Bro, you know, it, you're going to be bummed out for three straight decades. So look, as it's happening, I probably am leaning Detroit. And then I'm watching Stafford once again get his ass kicked. And you and Kyle were incredible on the code and the move of the vet. Like you start, oh, my arm, I think it's broken. Jules after you and Dan, those two fucking little buddy Lees, when they used to be all <laughs> fucked up, they'd run over to each other and like put, put each other back together. Like, like you know, uh, in MacGruber where he's like, it's okay. And he goes out to the van and they're all in pieces and he's trying to. <laughs> that's what playing with Danny and Jules was probably like. Those guys were just getting destroyed, so they had to have like a, a way to hide their concussions. Bod's looking pretty tight. <laughs> Bod's looking tight, bro. Bubs. Oh, um, I love your dick jokes. That's why I make them. <laughs> that's that's why I tell them. That's okay, why. all right. Look, we gotta get look, that that we gotta get that exchange yeah, right. Yeah, that's no, it's fun. You're right, no, he goes, right. fun it's I lo- it's fun to hear them. It's fun to say them. I don't know what the fuck he says. I got to watch. You're right, though. It's better. It's better. It's better. We needed a better delivery for that one. Uh, I don't I'm not going to push back on the staffer because I love him. I love him. Like, I feel like whenever you talk about and I obsess over the quarterback stuff, like you just weren't allowed to say he was awesome. It was Detroit, right? You just weren't allowed to. And you're watching it every week going, wait, I'm supposed to think this guy's a loser. Like, I think this guy's incredible. But then it all comes back to. Oh, oh, yeah, but on third down, he's looking at this. I'm like, man, I just wish I wish he had been with a better organization for 75 percent of his career, because I think Stafford may have been. And look, I even said this this morning. I think he would have been looked at completely differently if he was with one of the primo franchises. And I think his his all time, like his name would be ahead of a lot of guys that everybody else now thinks are unobtainable for his ceiling of what he'll be. Exactly right. If he had Sean McVay for most of his career, and I don't know if there's anything to this. I'd love for somebody to go back and look at it, and you at home, let me know. But back in the day, I feel like coaches got longer leashes, and I felt like there was more balance between offensive head coaches and defensive head coaches, and I felt like this is just a feel thing. I felt like coordinators stuck around longer. I felt like guys had more continuity. I felt with with free agency and shit. It's, I think it's harder in some ways to be a great quarterback and stay that way now 
than it was back then in some obvious ways. And it's easier in some obvious ways too. Um, which is why I love cold weather games, Ryan talking about the, the bills or the chiefs this weekend. I love to see the people that were uncomfortable, uh, this weekend because they're comfortable every Sunday. It's, it's okay. And all these people talking about it's unsafe, Ryan, I don't know where you land on this stuff. Players seem just fucking fine to me. I want to talk about bills and chiefs just really quick. I don't know if you noticed this, but I think Josh Allen, the best thing the Bills have going for him besides Josh Allen is the fact that Josh Allen just got over a slump and barely anybody noticed it. You know, uh, in the middle of this run, there was a period, um, and it included the Pats game, Chargers game, half of the Dolphins game, some of the decisions he made. And the Dallas game, he didn't really have to do much throwing the football. I don't know if he was dinged or what, but that's a slump that he got out of the way, and I thought he looked really good Monday. Uh, I thought he was awesome. And, you know, I think that was a game that was a bit like, hey, we're just better than these dudes. You know, you're up 14 nothing. Those two routes, like, were wide open and on the touchdowns. So then you're starting to think, you know, I just know how you guys are. I think it's a really, really tough sport. And when you think you're that much better than your opponent, and then in classic pick Pittsburgh fashion, you go, wait, if Buffalo doesn't score here. Like, is this game going to get weird? Is something going to happen? Um, and there's no TJ Watt out there. And, you know, it's just funny, like every time Pickens loses his shit and it's like just a reminder of like, you realize this is why he didn't go as high in the draft, right? Like as incredible yeah, that, as he that is. thing sucks because he's one of my favorite players and I can't. And there's maybe always that's... something. It's it, yeah. there's always something like I was joking around before the summer or this summer before the season started being like, all right, let me try to come up with like these fake props. And it was like first receiver to motherfuck his quarterback. Yeah, I was like, let me, and then I go, this is just mean. I'm uh -huh. not, I ended up not even doing the whole thing. And look, that's not the bigger part of it. So you're saying that he broke out of his slump. When I look at that Miami game. The second and, half of the Miami game is when he broke out of that slump. Okay. All right. That's fine. Cause that, that zero, the second pick is on fourth and two. The second pick's deep. on fourth and two. I think there's a lot of people. It's still not who, great. It's still no, not great. I mean, here, here's the deal, man. The first pick was bad, though. The first pick was bad. So you're telling me he's broken out of the slump in the last three halves? Okay. Yeah, because of the ball placement. You know, there are two All separate right. issues. If you look at the ball placement against the Chargers, and if you look at the ball placement against the Patriots, not very good. You know, it just, it just wasn't as good. And I wondered if in that run-heavy game in Dallas where he actually had tucked the, the rock and run a good bit. I think sometimes we think about Josh – as just the quarterback, right? Even though he's so clearly a position player, he's a quarterback and a position player. He's a tight end that's going to get five catches a game. You know what I mean? He ran the ball for 52 yards the other day. I'm not reducing him to a tight end, but what I am saying is the physical toll is that of a guy who's going to get the ball five times in the game, you know, running down the field, running quarterback power, taking off scrambling, and sometimes a little injury that's not on the injury report can affect, I would think, something as act as as um, mechanical as throwing the football. You know, like when I was hurt, you're not going to notice the difference for the most part. It's not a skill position. I could. This, you can. But this guy is a skill player who also plays like a position player. And I kind of wonder sometimes if he gets dinged, like you get a little bruise on your shoulder, you get a little little peck thing, or you get your back's bothering you, that fucks with your mechanics. And I know Matt Stafford's sore today, but Josh does that shit all the time, and he just keeps getting up. And so sometimes I wonder if he's a little dung, uh, dinged up. I, I think he looked a lot better the last, as you put it, three halves of football, and I, I'm excited for this weekend. I can't wait. I can't wait for this game. Do you have a lean? It's a really tough one, dude. It really is. Because the last one, it was like a Big 12 game. And they, they changed the rules in overtime over it. I was in I was at that game. Incredible. One of the best days of my football life. Uh, I was retired. I get to go watch my brother who was suited up for the Chiefs. He was hurt at the time. Went, went with the edibles that day. There was enough fireball at Arrowhead Stadium that I would have had a really rough one had I gone the other route. And I got to sit in the suite and watch that whole thing unfold. And I just can't get it out of my head. But this this matchup's going to be so much different, I would think. I would think this matchup's going to be about the run game. I would think this matchup would be about, like, hey, what are the differences between Joe Brady versus Spags the first time and this time? Because you got infinitely more tape than you did the first time. I think Nick Bolton wasn't there the first game.
So I think this game is going to be kind of unpredictable and more physical than the last playoff matchup. Yeah, I told myself like after wildcard weekend, like don't let this permeate too many of the thoughts in the divisional round here. But I've always had faith in Allen, despite the turnovers that drive me crazy. Like, I wasn't incredibly shocked that they ran the table the rest of the way. I think a lot of us looked at me like, have you realized how good this team is and how unlucky they are with some of the stuff? And I mean, it's funny how that Philly game with Jake Elliott hitting the 59 yard in the rain to send it to overtime. And you're like, Buffalo has been the better team here for three straight hours. Like, what yeah. is this outcome going to mean? And then Philly wins it. And we're like, all right, I'm supposed to think that like Philly's still really good and Buffalo's not like, come on, Buffalo looked like the better team the whole time. So, you know, whether you, the Dolphins defense that was missing a handful of super important guys, um, do I let that get in, get in my head too much that like, I'm, I'm scared to death of picking against Mahomes. I don't even want to pick against him, but it's like, was that a little bit easier or the weather cancel all that out? And the fact that this chief defense, like this is one of the five best defenses in the NFL. It's one it's of the in, three. It's one of the, cause Miami. You think it's three? The, oh, I, I made claims this year that it was the best defense in the NFL. Better than Baltimore. Well, look, it's, it's. I don't think – I think Baltimore's proven to be the better defense. I'm not going to disrespect Baltimore with their track record. But what I will say is um, I've seen Kansas City do this before where they get better as the year goes on. And I think Spags had less improvements to make. It was funny. I had him on the show, and I asked him, and he kind of skirted the question. Spags, do you have two different identities dreamt up for your team predicated on whether Chris Jones played or not? Because they were they were going to be totally two totally different groups. Um, I think they're great. The hardest thing is figuring out who to root for. Rye. I don't know who to root for. I love them both. Josh, Pat, Trick, Patrick, Josh. You know, if we're going with a city that deserves it, there's no. Then it's got to be Buffalo. No then I got to root for Buffalo yeah. this week here. All right, let's get to the mailbag and get you out of here, Rye. Thank you very much for your time on an NBA night. I think the Suns are still getting their ass kicked by Sacramento if you want an update. Sorry. No, no I'm, so, I'm sorry. No, it's a three-point game. All right. This one comes from Brendan O'Connell, and it is, what is the cringiest, most awkward coach locker room moment that you have witnessed? Well, on topic, I got to give it to, to uh, McDermott with the 9-11 stuff. I would just love to get him in a private moment and be like, how'd you think that was going to go over? Right. <laughs> what the fuck? Like, it's one of those things, it's like a marketing campaign that I'm like, you know, a marketing campaign that misses the mark and then like really goes over the line. Like when Florida State's athletic department did the MLK with the Florida State receiver gloves on floor, on, on Martin Luther King Day years ago. That. No, it was years ago. Somebody reminded all of us and brought it back. It was just him, but then he had his hands out. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> butt Drugs Pharmacy. Fucking Buffalo. Drugs? Buffalo really stormed the cockpit, didn't they, Monday? Uh, I want to see it. I want to hear you. You know what? You'll be able to get with somebody years after they retire and be like, were you in the room? You know, somebody that was in the room and be like, you got to take me through the whole I'm gonna thing. I'm going to find like, out because I know you got to get somebody. The, yeah, because, you know, you know, I can't get that interview. That's where you're the best. So do that. What's the Mendoza line for using a historical thing that's maybe not so great for one side of the equation? Like, because, you know, how people, you know, it's obvious you could do D-Day. Everybody's pretty happy about D-Day. You know, like, that's sad. I think you just, you go, hey, the first time we'd been attacked on our territory in like 200 plus years, don't use that one. <laughs> it's unbelievable. I remember Hugh Freeze, there wasn't a ton of love for him when he did the fake funeral, and none of us quite understood it. And remember we did a funeral and the whole motivation. Can you motivation explain that to me, why he did that? Well... The reason I know why is because he got mad at me because I made fun of it on the air. And then we actually connected over it. And I was like, look, I didn't understand the message. Like, you understand, I'm getting it kind of like, hey, you freeze, pretended he died and then did an open wake in the locker room. No, this is one of the best things I've ever seen. <laughs> With the right. thumbs up. It was at Liberty. It was right down the road. No, no, no. That was different. That wasn't fake. He was actually sick. Oh, he that was like, guy was really sick. Yeah. Yeah. Who something was that? else was that was Hugh Freeze. That Again? was when he was hurt. Yeah, that was when he was hurt. When he was at Ole Miss, look it up. He did 
I mean, do I have to get the terminology perfectly here? All right, Hugh Freeze. I don't think fake's death is what you want to look at, but do you have like see. something threat life threatening? <laughs> okay, do you have mesothelioma. <laughs> No, no, no. This is an old man. By the way, so this if you is... watched the Eagles last night, you might be entitled to uh, financial compensation. I feel like I feel like there could be some commercials at some point. All right, so <laughs> here's the title. Ole Miss football coach fakes his own funeral to motivate his players. That was in 2016. So yeah, uh, Freeze planned his own funeral to show players how to work toward their goals before, you know, life's clock shows zero. <laughs> or the NCAA drops the hammer. <laughs> Wow, that was pretty good. Uh, Hughes quote, I created a funeral scene for me and showed it to all the players. And the whole purpose is understanding that whatever you believe drives your behaviors and your behaviors drive your performance and your performance. It will give you some result. And we need to work backwards. This is the result I really want. Now are my beliefs and my behaviors going to get me the result? Uh, anyway, so I created a funeral scene. So anyway, like... It, all it did when it made its way to ESPN was like, what did Hugh Freeze do? And so, like, Van Pelt and I just, like, laughed about it. Or I think it was Canel and I at that point because Van Pelt and I were done in 15. And then I I heard from somebody with Ole Miss, and they are like, Hugh saw what you did. Because all the coaches used to watch, like, that midday show all the time because they're just at the office. And nothing. That's the you thing always about forget. getting popular. They all see it. Yeah, right. Oh, and especially like coaches. The number of times you go to facilities and they'd be like, we watch you guys. Every it's just on. It's not like, hey, the alarm is off or Silo's talking. Let's yeah. do nothing for three hours. It's yeah. just on because ESPN's on in the background like every fucking place you go to. And so he wasn't thrilled with me. And I was like, all right, I kind of get your point. Like, I got a different version of it. But it's, you know, looking back on it, I didn't want to argue with him. But I'm like, it's still fucking weird. Like, I just don't think there's many 18 to 22-year-olds who are like, holy shit. He's right. What if I died? What if I died right now? Would my beliefs match the results? Like, I just... I think you, know. you can get that across better than, you know, faking your own death. It's the Albert, Telling. Brooks, it's the Albert Brooks curb thing. You, you yeah, I know, that right. That's the yeah. best episode ever. It's the best. It's a great episode. I don't know if it's the best episode ever. I think people do it. I think it's a very California So we thing. were talking about this the other day. And by the way, PJ Fleck, I don't know you. I'm breaking the first rule of Fight Club. I don't know you, so I, I, I guess I'm not supposed to. You say didn't it. say anything. I said it. I don't well, give a I'm going to say it, and I've said it on this pod before. I've read the manifesto, and the thing is cringeworthy. And I'm not a big acronym guy. I don't like acronyms. So there are some guys that, you know, like before they block and tackle, they're like, hold on a second. What, fist? Family invested? Strong team? Oh, yeah. I'm going to make this play. You know, like, I guess there's some guys like that that need to to be reminded of why they're out there. You know, the guys that need to, they need the uh, the motivational speaker to come into the NFL locker room in the offseason. I, I don't need it. And I hate acronyms, and a lot of these are contrived. And me and Rye were talking about this the other day, and I realized we have the same bugaboo with P.J. Fleck. So we made some acronyms. And I'm going to be honest, I didn't work too hard at this, Rye. And maybe the point is that it's not that fucking hard to make an acronym. <laughs> All right. Uh, I got one for you. You want me to start this off, Rye? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's like, yeah, because I don't have any. <laughs> no, because I wrote them down somewhere else. I can't find them. <laughs> oh, shit. All right. <laughs> yeah. No, right. I'm, just, I'm just making it happen. Here I go. Here we go. Here we go. Football. All right. You know how that's spelled? All right. Yep. Focus only on the... Best available lot lizards. What is what is lot li lizards? What there, is there, it's um, slang in the trucker scene for prostitutes at the rest areas. You don't know this? Oh man, no, I'm not into the trucker scene. Oh, uh, it's a little. Although I joke. read a inside joke on the show. A lot of truckers yeah. listen. They do. Okay, that'd be good for the truckers. Then that would be good. Yeah, do you, it again. You don't get you know like. Don't get distracted. No, I get it. But just say it again now. Let me think of it as a trucker. Focus only on the best available lot lizards. Love get it. your Slim Jim. Walk back to your truck. Don't spend all night out there. Um, you're up. Ladder. Leadership. Ascending. Descending. Determination. Energy results. <laughs> That's good. 
That's really good. Oh, that's good. All right. Um, huddle. Have huddle unity during difficult life events like playing at Minnesota for PJ Fleck. I got That's one. A good I one. got one for you, Ryan. This um, this is tailored tailored for me specifically and what my life's about. Yep, yep. This is uh, the acronym is Bill, and it goes Boss Instilling Life Lessons. Belichick or Simmons? Simmons. Either works, really. <laughs> it really does for either of us, dude. Only here for me. All right. Don't remind me another one. Tackle. Braintree. I wasn't there long. Toughness, attitude, cost efficiency, know how, leadership, efficiency. <laughs> I like that touch. You got a future in this. This is so fucking stupid how easy this is. I know, but how stupid do you think they felt sitting in the fucking meeting putting that together? Can you imagine the guy that had to go staple that together and make copies of that? <laughs> you and, can't have this many, dude. And just, There's some rule. You can't. Have you have you looked at it? I felt like. Yes. I felt like. I looked at it. I, felt I like, read it. I, I, felt like, I felt like Jessica Yellen looking through like um, a deposition. I was like. I was like, this is my version of a deposition. I'm going to read all 40 pages. I want to know exactly what the fuck is going on in that scenario. And here's what I found out. Nothing's going on. It's just a bunch of acronyms. Fist. Okay. I have one more. Stop. Selling things omnipresent potentially. <laughs> I didn't know which way you were going to go with this. You decided to make them just make no sense. Yeah, yeah. I just that was the whole idea. Is the last one wasn't going to make. You can keep any that. You can what, keep that bill acronym. By the way, you like ladder though. Get a shirt. Ladder. Yeah. No. no. Ladder. We'll, we'll work on. Do you like how I did ascending, descending? That was my favorite part. I did. Next to double efficiency. All right. Result. Okay, and this this is uh, this is. Imagine being nineteen and going. Oh, I don't have it in me today. <laughs> <sighs> No, that's the Damn only it. time that it actually works. I can tell you this from experience. Because when you're 19, you're just like, man, life is fucking hard, dude. Like, I got I got three-hour practices. I got a curfew. They can keep me here as long as they want. Then I got to go to class and all that shit. Yeah, like, 19 is fun, but it's the one time in your life where you allow people to put you through stupid shit. Try reading acronyms at 33. That's what made me leave the NFL. Shit like reading. Did you moneyline Phoenix? Did you moneyline Phoenix? Uh, yeah. They won. Yes, right. <laughs> you would never steer me wrong. Now, did the Clippers first half moneyline hit? Because that's the other side of that parlay. All uh, chalk, baby. You... All chalk. Yeah, no, they won. They were up four. There we go, so guys. There we go. Okay. I, I look. This sucks because every public. Like, I went 500 in college football in our contest, and then I've been on a bit of a losing streak here as we get into the postseason. Like, I just haven't been able to pull, pull it together here. Um, but I get really worried when I get super hot on the NBA thread. Like, I just throw you and Big Cat a random one every now and then. What's the look on your face? Hockey parlay hit. Oh, my God. Listen. I'm going to stop talking. The Jets handle business. The Chicago Blackhawks won in a shootout. And the Edmonton Oilers and the Leafs have three seconds to go under seven goals. It's 4-2. So I don't want to speak too soon because somebody pulled the fucking goalie. But it's final. It's final in Edmonton. Everybody can go back into the tunnels underground to their houses. All right. How about this? How about this for one? NHL. Knowing hockey legitimately. Yes, dude. Yes. How about this made my life, dude? The, 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 for all the shit I give hockey players... I don't think any of them hear it because that would be bad if they did. But the Flyers were putting on dog masks. Yeah, I don't know, man. And you think that cheapens it? Okay. All right. Next. No, part. I don't think it cheapens it. I what? So you like it? You like it as a city wide yeah. thing? Because yeah. All right. All right. Look, that's your thing. That's your ruling. Okay. I have, I have no ruling on that one. Now, yeah. Jim Mercy doing thing. dreams and nightmares after every game. That that gets a little old after a while. Okay. This is. Uh, I like this one too. Why didn't this is from one of our 
British fans. I think he's British. He's so, it's somewhere in Europe. Good day, mate. One of the English speaking Europeans. Uh, why, why don't Americans know how to chant and banter at their games? He's talking about, um, God, I can't even do the fucking British accent. It's stuck between Australia and you can't that that's what that was. Why, why don't Americans know how to chant or banter at games? And I guess he means like condescendingly that we don't do the things that they do. Right. Correctly so. They're so much better at it. Their chants, their songs, they learn the songs, they come up know. with cool lyrics, their remixes. Dude, I'm telling you, they got it. They got us on a lot of stuff. You see people up late at night drinking wine and smoking cigarettes with one year old kids up at fucking 1 a.m. They're eating pizza, cheeseburgers, French That's fries. Italy. They're not as fat. No, dude, it's everywhere. South of France, SOF. Ever heard of it? You even have an Instagram account? So the point <laughs> is, is that there's a lot of stuff that I notice where I just like, I was in, when I was in New Zealand, I'm like, why is this town dead? And they're like, man, holiday. I'm like, well, how long's holiday? And they're like, two weeks. And I was like, where does everybody go? This is a major city. And they're like, everybody has a second place here. I'm like, really? Everybody just has a second house? They're like, yeah, for the most part, a lot of people have second homes. Yeah, but you got to buy your grocery bags, Ryan. Um, I know. I got to get better at that. Uh, here's guy. my problem, and I want to turn the Thanks. question back on you, Kevin, in Europe. I don't know. Why don't you guys do uh, a thing where you wave to children hospitals and shit like that like why don't you do that or wave to hugh freeze or uh, like we throw people through tables we have like live bison run out on a football field like you got to admit there's something about america that's kind of cool even if it's like kind of fucked up and i know you guys think about it's like a like kind of an australia or russia like we're a mix between australia and russia but we have do, people said that is that being I, that's kind of how openly? i feel like people look at us um but we, we got tigers in cages. <laughs> Guy had an alligator inside Citizens Bank Park last year. Do you have, like, in your county, in, like, Derbyshire, imagine if the highest paid employee in Derbyshire would run down a hill past the rock every game and a bunch of big guys behind him. That's Dabo Sweeney. Do you have a Dabo Sweeney? You know? I don't know, but I, look, you know, some stuff we we're doing better, some stuff they're doing better, right? I mean, but that's that's point. fair. But when it comes to chanting and being passionate and almost being romanticism, uh, no, that's not the right word. Uh, rom I could just say romantic, the romanticism, the way they they treat sport. You know what? There's a there's a different lane of passion that they have that we'll never we'll never. We're, I Dude, think we're just too cool. I was standing right next to you, and you know what I'm about to say. When they did Dixieland Delight in T Town, and you're telling me that a bunch of British guys singing a song that's like seven minutes long, and I have no idea what it means, is better than that. No, it's not better than that. It was the it was the happiest I think I've been in the last six months. The place is incredible. I can't wait. I can't wait for you to go to Baton Rouge and see what it's like there. Did you hear Legend on the Paul Fine Feinbaum show? No. I missed that one. He's, that. That's the one episode. I he's, missed he's a, he's a, he called in. He's a guy from Alabama. And he said in a very loud voice, if you guys hire Dabo Sweeney, I'm going to go to the 50 yard line and light myself on fire. <laughs> he said, if you hire Dabo Sweeney, I'm going to rip my arm off and beat myself with it. <laughs> and I feel the same way. I do. I'm so thankful that they hired the guy from Washington. My kids are going to, uh, to Alabama. The last question, and I don't know if this is any good, Ryan. I sent it to you earlier. It's probably not, but I think you're pretty good with history. Um, the question is, and this is from uh, Dash Conrad. The Industrial Revolution changed the face of the modern novel forever. Discuss, citing specific, example, specific examples. Hey, Ryan, the modern novel is not a book in this scenario. Your big book guy. Yeah, but I'm not a I'm not a novel reader, so I'm actually not your guy. I'm not your guy on that one. I saw the other one. I saw the other one that was a little nasty. It was like, can he name one piece of work not done by Chernow, Gran, or McCullough? Like that one was like, fuck off, dude. How about the entire Philbrick catalog? How about all of it? How about Atkinson? Um, how about Holland? Whether it's Normandy or Sicily, forty three. I mean, what else do you want from me over How here? How about Shark yeah. by Brian Scarry in the National Geographic? How about Fli Peter Stark? Peter Stark, Young Washington, Astoria. Peter Stark, a Missoula guy. 
You want to tell me this guy doesn't love history? That guy, is that you? Yeah, that's me coming off of our family schooner in the late 1700s. <laughs> that's unbelievable. So yeah, speaking of the Industrial the Re- Revolution, how did it treat you? Uh, it was good for us. Look at my clothes. Look at my vest. Look at my bow tie. Unfortunately, we lost a lot of money in Haddock. We, most of my father, well, our people had not diversified our bonds. And so you gotta there was a Haddock shortage. Bonds. Right. We, we, had a, we had a summer place in New Brunswick. It was incredible. Um, but yeah, I, I saw that. But as far as novels, works of fiction, I, I rarely, rarely ever, ever dabble into that. I don't know why. Um, but I need to send you. Did you read The Road yet by McCarthy? Did I send you a copy of that? I don't know if you sent the me. Best, let me look at my bookshelf. <laughs> best piece of fiction. How many pages have you read total of the books that I've sent you? That you sent me? I read that book. Uh, hold on. It's right here. You would like Astoria. I could link you up. You could come up to Polson. I read like a hundred pages of this book. Oh, Paul Thoreau, The Happy Isles of Oceana. I'm surprised you weren't more into that. Were you I into the hundred pages? The problem is, yeah. three kids. That thing is away. thick with two C's. That's a thick book. I mean, yeah, dude. This is there's four hundred and oh, we're in the fives. If you include like the glossary or whatever the fuck you want to call it, five hundred twenty-eight pages, Ryan. Um, Sir Andrew Roberts. God damn. This Napoleon book. For a this short Napoleon guy, book. that's a long book. Hey, what the fuck is that? Oh, wait. I thought you were talking about me. No, I'm not talking about you. I'm yet. talking about Napoleon. Yeah. You... yeah. Neither, of you are, neither of you are short for your time. <laughs> In actuality. Uh... <laughs> no, he was still pretty small. The English Boy, guys don't he... even have the coolest chant. They, the Viking thing is the coolest thing. Oh, no. The Kiwis. New Zealand. You would say that we gentrified it, but the quality of life in, uh, in that country is higher than in Minnesota. Um, do you have any mailbag questions you'd like? Otherwise, Ryan, otherwise I'm going to let you go. You never answered about That's the it. Industrial Revolution. I am pro-Industrial I don't. I don't have... I don't, yeah, but specific to him asking about how novels pivoted in tone. No, and no, all he's that, not talking about that. I, I'm I not think, that guy. I think he means like today. I think he, I think he means like modern life. I think it's a fancy way of saying modern life, modern novel. That's what I'm saying. I had to look it up. Well, I, I'm not as I, I'm disappointing him and the audience. So, are you pro industrial revolution? And if so, the first or the second? There's no replacing the first one. Hold on. <laughs> I had something I had something written in a Ryan Rosillo voice. Look, I, this this is me and Ryan Rosillo. You know, the funny thing is any of this history, like people think I have like every year down or every era, and I'm like, You probably no, don't man, even know when the holes. cotton gin was invented. You fucking moron. Hey, look, hey, look, the output greatly increased, no doubt about it. But then there's a rise in population. You know, that's how you would start that thing, wouldn't you? <laughs> <laughs> you you <laughs> look, look, the output greatly increased, no doubt about it. But if you think about it, the second industrial revolution is where we really got into trouble. You know, globalization, internal combustion engines, urban crowding. Um, you don't like urban crowding. You urban crowding? Do you think I would have said urban crowding? Yeah, urban crowding. I don't think I would have done that. Urban Crowd, he's Channing's brother, D3 guy. <laughs> Urban Crowd. Uh, all right, Rye. I will see you soon, okay. buddy. Have a good night. I'll tell you what, though. I've got some, I've got some homework. What, Industrial Literally. Revolution? Yeah, I'm Wait on it. Wait you get right, to the time, Agricultural Revolution. Yeah, no doubt. That was the real no mistake. Doubt. That was the real mistake. Hey, look, dude. I... I was in this big Polynesian sort of the Maoris, you know, that's where my headspace has been the last month. So apologies. No, it's good to have you back. Thanks for coming on the pod, buddy. Talk to you soon.